All right, man, peace. So it seems as though the most popular debate within NBA circles is whether or not LeBron James either has or will soon surpass Michael Jordan as being the most preeminent or at least considered the most preeminent NBA player in basketball history. Well, there's a columnist by the name of Kevin Pelton who believes that LeBron already has done so. So, of course, they're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. LeBreezy making it to his eighth straight conference finals, this time with one of his weaker supporting casts. So, Max, I ask you this. If LeBron yeah. wins the chip with this team, has he closed the gap on Jordan as the GOAT? Well, before Max Kellerman answers, let me respond first. If LeBron James were to beat this Golden State Warriors team, in my view, he certainly will surpass Larry Bird. As of right now, I have Bird 5 and LeBron 5A. If he were to beat this Golden State Warriors team, he would definitely pass by Larry Bird, and I will consider putting him above Magic Johnson. For me, if LeBron were to win this series over Golden State, that would put him on my Mount Rushmore of NBA players. Because as of right now, I have a Jordan, Kareem, Bill Russell, Magic Johnson. So once again, if LeBron were to win this series, he would certainly surpass Larry Bird. And I believe on my list, I will probably put him above Magic Johnson if he were to defeat the Golden State Warriors. Because LeBron has never played with a player on the caliber of a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and a James Worthy. Now, of course, he did play with D-Wade and Chris Bosh, which, which gets slept on. But please remember that Magic needed to have players of the caliber of a Kareem and a James Worthy because he had to go against teams that had Dr. J and Moses Malone. He had to go against teams that had Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, Dennis Johnson, Bill Walton, etc. So that was the true era of super teams, the 80s. Right now in the 2010s, they're just building back up to the super teams that they had back in the 80s. But once again, were LeBron James to win this finals against the Golden State Warriors, he would be on my Mount Rushmore. Right now, I'm just considering what I put him above Magic, but most likely I will. He'll definitely pass Larry Bird with a victory in these finals. And I'm, I'm sure there are many people out there, pass Larry Bird, he been past Bird. <laughs> a lot of these guys don't understand the history of the NBA and what they're saying when they make certain statements. Yes, he has. He'd be right there. And um, Kevin Pelton right now on ESPN.com. Let me say this very quickly. If LeBron were to win this series against Golden State, and this is assuming that Golden State's stars stay healthy, if their top four guys stay healthy and say Iggy comes back around game three, and LeBron were to win this series in seven games, that would open up the conversation for greatest player ever. It would open up the conversation. I heard Shannon Sharp say that if LeBron were to win this series, it would end the conversation. For me, it would open up the conversation. Now it would become something realistic. Has an article that um, echoes and, and largely substantiates what I've been saying for a long time on the air now, that Jordan's peak will likely not be matched by LeBron because LeBron's not actually getting better when you take overall value both sides of the floor. Absolutely, and thank you for saying that, sir. And when he says Michael Jordan's peak, he's talking about from 1987 to 1993. I mean, really, 87 to 92, that five-year stretch from the 1987-88 season to the 91-92 season. He won three MVPs. He probably averaged in shooting percentage about 53%. He scored well over 30 points a game every year. Averaged something around six and a half rebounds, six and a half assists and led the league in steals multiple times, had over 100 blocks in the year that he won Defensive Player of the Year as well as MVP in the 87-88 season. No player has ever matched that peak in regards to proficiency and overall numbers. Not even LeBron's stretch from about 2011 to about 2016 or 17 can match what Jordan did for that stretch of five years. That is Michael's peak. Jordan's peak is quantifiably you know, higher than LeBron's. But if you ask the question, who you'd rather have at the beginning of their career, you're trying to win as many championships as possible, be as good for as long as possible, who's giving you most value throughout their career, peak and longevity, then maybe it's already LeBron. And now when you... Well, when you make statements like that, then of course, those of us who are three-dimensional thinkers and astute, now we have to enter other variables into the conversation. Like, what exactly are these players on? 
because of course if we're going to be two-dimensional we could look at lebron and say well he's actually gotten bigger and stronger in the last three years but for those of us who think on a three-dimensional level we'll ask why is that and that's why i think that there is a separation there's a partition that has to be made between players from the 80s and before or even the early early 90s and before and the players of today who are certainly biochemically enhanced to some degree now people will say well it's a level playing field because they're all on something well not quite when you're a lebron james and you're spending millions of dollars on your body per year you have access to the greatest biochemist in the world believe me he's being given concoctions that will allow him to beat the test that's if he's even being administered a test because as we know chris paul the head of the nba's players association does not allow players to be stringently tested for performance enhancing drugs particularly hgh and you can look that up so chris paul is another person on my radar but he's not really as relevant but people really have to try to make sure that they understand and fully grasp the gravity of their statements when they say that well lebron is better than jordan even though he only has three championships and jordan has six i've mentioned this on another video with that as precedent we have to now go back and reassort the order of the nba's greatest players now we have to put chris paul over isaiah thomas even though chris paul has never won a championship because more likely than not he's going to end his career with more points more assists and more rebounds than isaiah thomas that's if he has not already passed him in those in those different criteria even though chris paul has never won a championship because we're going by cumulative numbers we're going to have to go back and put Dirk Nowitzki over Larry Bird. We're going to have to put Karl Malone over Tim Duncan. Because we're being told now that it's strictly about longevity and cumulative numbers as opposed to success in the final round of the NBA playoffs. When you talk about the other stuff that goes into being the GOAT, you know, one of the thing, drawbacks about being the monster, the invincible monster, which was Jordan, I mean, at his best, no, none of those finals teams took him seven games. Jordan, the first time he got a and Jordan actually is being penalized for being too great in the NBA Finals. Now, the modern-day, quote-unquote, woke generation, liberal blacks and liberal Caucasians, etc., are trying to revise history and claim that he did not face great teams in the Finals. And LeBron is 3-5, and five, soon to be 3-6 and six in the Finals because he's facing super teams. Let me say this very quickly. That Seattle Supersonics team from 1996 could guard the entire floor. They had the defensive player of the year in Gary Payton, and they had multiple players that could make three-point shots. They would be an NBA championship-level team today, no doubt in my mind about that. The Utah Jazz from 97 and 98, who made the finals in back-to-back -back years, people like to look at footage of them and claim that they couldn't play today, they wouldn't be as great today because supposedly they did not have great athletes. Well, this is the NBA, it's not the Olympics. Yes, athleticism is a great bonus when you have it, but the NBA is a skill game. Always has been, always will be. It's about your skills. What makes LeBron a transcendent player is not just his great athleticism, but it, it is his extremely high skill level. That's what makes him soon to be on Mount Rushmore if he's able to win another championship or two. Now, if he beats a transcendent team like the Golden State Warriors, once again, he'll knock Magic Johnson off of my Mount Rushmore. But the NBA is a skill game, and please understand that in 1998, the Utah Jazz defeated the San Antonio Spurs with Tim Duncan and David Robinson. They also defeated the LA Lakers with the prime Shaquille O'Neal, a young Kobe Bryant who was in his first All-Star game in that regular season, Eddie Jones, Nick Van Exel, that team was stacked. They used to out-execute you, and Phil Jackson is on record as stating in their 2000 playoff run that he proactively tried to make sure that they would avoid the Utah Jazz in the playoffs because he knew what they could do to his team. The LA Lakers did not really understand how to win until about 2001. In 2000, they were still trying to figure out how to win in big spots in clutch moments. That was a growing process and he knew that to face a team with that much experience, that could be the death knell for his squad. He's on record as stating that he tried to avoid the Utah Jazz in the LA Lakers' first championship run under his tenure, that being in the 99-2000 season. So people truly don't understand the game. They try to look at old footage and they see a Caucasian and say, well, he can't play because he doesn't have a 40-inch vertical, all type of nonsense. But they conveniently forget how J.J. Barea, 
at five foot six, 140 pounds, shut down LeBron James. Ain't that a bitch? <laughs> Not an all-star, as I've mentioned, Scottie Pippen lost his game seven to the Pistons, the defending champions, by the way. And Pippen didn't play game seven because of migraine. Then Pippen made a leap forward. He got better than, you know, than he was the previous year. And so in his second season with an all-star who was now in his prime, Jordan never again didn't win the championship in under seven games. But he keeps saying that Pippen did not play in game seven of 1990. Scottie Pippen stated himself he could not answer the bell. He tried to play. He folded up under the pressure. And 1990 was not the Bulls' season to win the championship. The Pistons were better than them mentally. The Bulls were not ready. So, Michael won six. He gets credit for six. In 1990, Scottie Pippen could not answer the bell. It would have taken the Bulls' best effort, both physically and mentally, that entire season for them to win game seven in Detroit. It was not going to happen. But the problem with being invincible like that and being perceived that way is you never really get to slay the monster. When do you get to really overcome the odds? So not only is, would LeBron have a peak that rivals Jordan's, even if it falls a little short and better longevity, he will have now slain the monster. How many times? Guys, he, especially if it's against Golden State, Stephen A., if it's against Golden State, that means they're now 2-2. Two and two. And by the way, that was a 73-win Golden State team that then added Kevin Durant. LeBron wasn't on the 73-win team, and he didn't add Kevin Durant. In fact, he lost Kyrie Irving. Whether that's of his own doing or not is besides the point. The fact of the matter is, you know, Golden State won 73 games. Kevin Durant came, joined the team. LeBron James beat that 73-win team. Well, once again, we all know why. LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers were able to defeat the Golden State Warriors in the 2016 Finals. There were a bevy of things that happened in sequence that assisted him in being able to overcome that 3-1 lead. I'm not taking anything away from LeBron. He's an all-time great player. But let's please understand that there were about seven or eight things. It wasn't even like just one player went down with injury because that happens. But when Draymond Green gets suspended, when Steph Curry has a debilitating injury that he never seems to be able to get over throughout those playoffs especially in the finals he was never the same after he came back when you have an Andre Iguodala who had full body spasms that stopped him from being able to play defense to his optimal when you have an Andrew Bogut who goes out with a gruesome knee injury in game five of that finals so on and so forth it was just too many incidents one after another for anyone to think that Golden State was going to be able to recover from that and then, of course, you had that freight train, LeBron James, just coming down the lane unmolested. Loses to them the next year because they added KD After and the now lost package. Kyrie Irving. And if under those circumstances, he then beats... Did you hear what Stephen A. Smith said? He said after the stimulus package, he's talking about when Draymond Green got suspended. Because even he knows if Draymond is there in game five, that series is over in five. Because he's orchestrating their defense and... Most probably, Andrew Bogut is not even in position to get his knee rolled over by J.R. Smith in Game 5 if Draymond Green is there, as he was supposed to be, had he not imploded. Beats Golden State? What else can he do? Well, first of all, I just want America to show, to know, that I had nothing to do with this question that was presented on this show today. <laughs> um, I accept the fact that it's a question that, that Max Kellerman, Max Webster... Uh, would like to explain and, and, and interpret and all of that other stuff. I'm not listening to that nonsense. The fact of the matter is, is that LeBron James will never be Michael Jordan, not in my eyes. Five NBA Finals losses has something to do with that. Not even just the five losses, but the way that he lost the 2011 Finals, it's not going to happen. But if LeBron were to beat a stacked Golden State team in the Finals with the team that he has, it would open up the conversation for consideration. That's what it would do. It's just amazing to me how people try to concoct these narratives, though. Now it's, well, all of LeBron's teams were the underdogs in the finals. Well, why is that? Because from 2010 all the way to 2016, LeBron had the team that on paper was viewed as being the most talented in the NBA. And supposedly, he's the best player in the NBA, and now he's talked about as being the greatest player ever. So why is his team underwhelming? to such a degree in the regular season that they're considered the underdog by the time they get to the finals. That's a reflection on him that so many of his teams are considered the underdog when they get to the finals. It's not that he's some little engine that could, that gets to the mountaintop and finally slays the dragon. No, his teams underwhelm in the regular season. 
because they're playing in the LeBron James system. Michael Jordan's teams, you never felt like there was any juice, there was not one drop of juice left in the tank in regards to their ability to play at their optimal best. That's why they had so many seasons winning 60 plus games and Jordan and Pippen would max out on both offense and defense. That's what made them the Goliath. It wasn't that their team was stacked because their teams were not stacked. No matter what these idiots and these revisionists try to postulate to the people. The first Bulls 3P team had two Hall of Fame level players, two All-Stars, that being Michael Jordan and Scotty. The second 3P team had two Hall of Famers and once again only two All-Stars, that being Michael and Scotty. That's it. That was not a super team era. And really, if we want to go there, they slayed their dragon in 96 when they swept the Orlando Magic because that team was stacked and that team was supposed to take over the Eastern Conference for the remainder of the 90s. Michael Jordan broke up that potential dynasty. You know, a career 33 point per game average in the postseason for Michael Jordan would have something to do with that. Michael Jordan winning six NBA Finals, six NBA Finals MVP, and never allowing a series to go seven games would have something to do with that. Michael Jordan averaging better than 30 uh, for 12 straight for 12 straight years, okay? Well, that's not accurate. Michael Jordan did not average over 30 for 12 straight years. You just pulled that out of your ass, Stephen A. Smith. That would have something to do with that. And that's in the postseason, too, not just the regular season. Not to mention the fact that the level of competition does matter to me. I think about the road to prosperity. One of the things I lamented about this particular player series, and this, this is where, this is where, and by the way, can I get my grab, please? Because we know, because remember, I'm about to be just a touch little critical of the greatest player in the world, who's one of the greatest players to have ever lived in LeBron James, who should be on the Mount Rushmore, all of those other. I've got to make sure we, oh, this 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 make sure we read up there. Great father, great husband, generous philanthropist, actor, director, extraordinaire, the LeBron James Family Foundation, the I Promise Initiative. I look at the bottom, at the very bottom in, in tiny font, it says, also a great actor and clutch player, played all 82 games, clean diet. <laughs> now, I wonder when it says clean diet, what exactly is that referring to? Is that referring to just food or is that also in reference to performance enhancing drugs? Because as I've noted in numerous videos that I've made, Stephen A. Smith clearly has alluded to LeBron James using PEDs in many of his more cryptic statements. Initiative. Did I leave anything out? Did I leave it? I just want to make sure I didn't leave anything out because my God, we are, we're, we're getting back to basketball. I'm trying to stay with basketball. I'm not questioning LeBron the man. I'm not questioning LeBron the human being. I'm not questioning LeBron James the chair. His is the philanthropist. I got a question I'm not for questioning you. LeBron the businessman. I don't know, hold on, hold on, Max, because his his kids might be watching. His boys are definitely watching. The supporters are definitely watching. I want to make sure that we that before I let you go, Max. I just want to ask you one question before I finish my argument. I'm well, before you finish your argument, let's also note that you're not questioning LeBron the politician either because that's his main alter ego is as a politician. I'm going to come to you and then I'm going to finish my argument. I want to ask you this question, Max. Have I been kind enough, Max? Have I, have I pointed out the things that I need to point out about LeBron James so I can actually be uh, not be accused of eviscerating him just because I had the temerity, the unmitigated goal to bring up something slightly critical about basketball have i covered all the great things about lebron james have i done it well you have to do that because lebron has such a fervent cult of personality as all great politicians do you do have to make sure that you let people know that you understand how great of a player he is and he needs to hear that because it's very clear that the brother lebron J james even with all his great accomplishments is still very insecure for whatever reason did you mention his acting Oh, I did mention his acting. I mentioned his acting, the writing, the direction. I mentioned that he all brought along. Yeah, he was pretty good in train wreck. He was really good at acting as if he had enough hair to cover the top of his scalp, <laughs> like he was depicted as in train wreck. I said, shit, he needs to hire that makeup guy. Whoever it was that got his hair looking like that in train wreck, he needs to hire him full time. Did you mention that he brought along the people he came up with, provided that they pulled oh. their weight? 
Ah, oh, damn it, Max, you got me there. My bad, Maverick, Carter, Rich, Paul, and, and, and Randy Mims, and all of these guys. I mean, hey, hey, but listen, man, there's people that's working within the Cavs organization that he's helped get started. There's thousands of kids he's gotten scholarship for. I mean, Max, you're right. I, I'm sorry, I left that out. My bad, I'm, I'm sorry, I left it out. And did, did I leave anything else out? I just want to make sure, Max, did I leave anything else out? Yeah, don't leave out the fact that you can forget ever getting a sit-down interview with LeBron James. You can forget that, Stephen A. Smith. I've noted this already. It's very clear that Stephen A. Smith is tired of the image of LeBron James. It's obvious to me that he knows a lot about LeBron that he's not willing to spill the beans on. He understands what LeBron James means to the average so-called black child, quote-unquote so-called black child, that idolizes him because of the cult of personality that he's fostered, willfully fostered and willingly fostered because LeBron needs that. He needs that adulation to feel like he's somebody. And once again, I'm sure that Stephen A. Smith knows a lot about LeBron that he's not willing to divulge, but he lets a little tidbit drop here and there, and he's annoyed by the bullshit. He's annoyed by the facade. And let me say this. LeBron James, for all his quote-unquote foibles, he's done great things for his community. As I've already stated, he seems to be a great image for his sons to look up to. That's really all that matters. And when I do cover LeBron, I cover him from the standpoint of a basketball player, not as a person. I don't know him. I will every once in a while address some of the personality issues that I see in him that I also notice amongst many so-called black men. That's why I address it, because these are things that we need to pay attention to so that we can improve and remove ourselves from this situation incrementally, mentally, spiritually. We have to remove ourselves from this condition, from this environment. I'm talking about trying to be so plugged in in regards to being spiritually invested in this society. It just is what it is. But just getting back to LeBron James, it's very obvious that Stephen A. Smith knows some things. But you know what? That's what my channel's for. I can say certain things that Stephen A. Smith can't say on TV. I'm sure I'm not privy to the level of information that Stephen A. Smith is privy to. But I can use my overall understanding to put two and two together. Now leave anything else out. Probably, but it's only a two-hour show, Stephen A. And how okay, it's only a two-hour show. My bad, Max Kellerman, my bad. All I'm trying to say is this. From a basketball perspective, I just lamented the other day. Indiana was babies. Toronto had their heart snatched before the series even began. The second they knew I have LeBron a James was who they would be going up against. And, of course, Boston doesn't have Kyrie. Who did Jordan have to go through? The Celtics, the Pistons. His Swerton won their first title against the Lakers with Magic Celtics Johnson. Have the Portland crew with Clyde, the Clyde Drexler. And every, yes, that's, and everybody. yes, that's very inaccurate. People need to stop saying that Michael Jordan went through the Celtics. Michael Jordan did not go through the Celtics. He never played them in the playoffs during his championship run era. By the time the Bulls got good, the Celtics were no longer a real factor in regards to winning the East. They went out in the 91 playoffs, I believe, against the Pistons and the 92 against the Cavaliers. So the teams that the Bulls played in the conference finals were the teams that beat the Celtics in the semifinals. The Celtics were never in the Bulls bracket in the second round. So by the time whatever team it was faced Chicago that were in the Celtics bracket. They had already defeated the Celtics and then met up with the Bulls in the conference finals. Everybody else, Utah twice. What about the way? What about the Indiana Pacers with Rick Smith and, and Reggie Miller? Miller and all these what had... about the Knicks? What... Well, Stephen A. Smith, people are going to poo-poo those teams today. That's part of the strategy to market LeBron as the greatest ever. The Knicks of the 90s were no good. The Pacers of the 90s were no good. When Jordan faced them, they don't mention the Orlando Magic who the Bulls swept, even though they had Shaq and Penny, who, for those of you who never saw Penny Hardaway play, I maintain he would have been greater than Kobe Bryant had he not been hurt. Many people would disagree. It's okay. It is what it is. Penny Hardaway was sensational before he got hurt. Uh, the Bulls pretty much ended any opportunity they had to do anything in the East. And once Shaq decided to leave Orlando and go to L.A., they were done. Penny Hardaway got hurt. That was a wrap. What about the when you Joe and LeBron, Oakley and Mason and those for that matter? Huh? All those guys sometimes faced good opponents, sometimes bad. Here's my question for you. LeBron Steven hasn't had to go against let's that level of competition. Cavs, let's say the Cavs make it to the finals and they play the Warriors. Who are you picking this year? Provided health. I'm picking the Warriors. I'm picking the Warriors. 
Of course. Of course. And it's not because you think KD's better than LeBron. You know LeBron's better than KD. It's that LeBron has Kevin Love and KD has Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and Draymond Green. In other words, the Warriors are just better. That's my point. Well, are they truly that much better on paper? Or do they just know how to use their players better? Of course they have KD. KD nullifies LeBron. But even before that, the Warriors were considered a far better team than LeBron's team. Why is that? Who in the hell thought that the Warriors would be considered the best team coming into the 2014-2015 season? Steve Kerr's first year where they won 67 games came out of nowhere. Once again, LeBron James' team was viewed as being the most talented team on paper. With him, Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving. Why is it that LeBron James' teams keep underwhelming in the regular season to the point where they're always considered the underdog by the time they get to the finals? Why is that? We're, I'm saying that point. I think if LeBron beats this Warriors team in the finals, he will have closed the gap because I don't think he's going to beat the Warriors team. Because you and I both know he's not going to beat the Warriors team. Because in order to do that, he has to have such a superhuman level of performance, it's almost unthinkable. Hold so on. if he actually pulls that off, what are we going to say? Hold it. it happen? Hold it. Hold it. I'm not going to act like it didn't happen. I'm going to give LeBron credit, and he's probably going to be on my Mount Rushmore. Because, Max, you're talking about one opponent. I'm talking about the road to prosperity. In other words, what I'm saying is I get to take into account the totality of your career and all the opponents you had to go through en route to capturing titles. And I'm saying that the road that Michael Jordan had to travel before he ultimately, and while and during he ultimately repeated championships, the road was significantly more difficult for him you than and it I was both for LeBron James. That Michael Jordan, in terms of opponents, in terms Michael of opponents. Well, I'm not quite sure about that, Stephen A. Smith. I mean, here's what I'll say. Michael had to go against the Detroit Pistons in the late 80s that built him up. LeBron had to go against the Pistons in the mid-2000s that built him up. Uh, LeBron, he pretty much had to wait until the Celtics got old to beat them. Jordan and his Bulls never even got the opportunity to, to face the older Celtics in the playoffs. Now, when you compare Jordan's competition in the 90s to LeBron's competition in the 2010s in regards to their conference, I think that the Knicks and even the Pacers in 98, I won't say Miami in 97 or, or Cleveland in the early 90s, I don't, I'm, I don't think that they were viewed as teams that really had a chance to beat the Bulls. Jordan was just so transcendent that once he was able to get to the mountaintop, no one was given a, a truly realistic opportunity or, or chance to beat them. Now, with LeBron in the 2010s, I mean, there were some series against the Pacers or against the Celtics or the Bulls where people thought, eh, but it was pretty much the same dynamic. The difference is the finals. LeBron has never shown himself to have the true ability to rise to the occasion in every finals once again he did not start to really dominate in the finals until he came back to cleveland he was good to very good in the finals with miami or sometimes horrific like he was against dallas he was very good in the series against oklahoma city he was pretty good in the first series against san antonio for him he was average in the second series against san antonio his first truly transcendent series in the finals was in 2016 against the Warriors. 2015, he was just, you know, he was pretty much just, you know, shot jacking. That's all he was doing. He was taking 38, 39 shots a game, and everybody was talking about how he should be the MVP of that series. It was nonsense. So that's the main separation in regards to the playoffs. Regular season, Jordan at his peak is just a better player. You and I both know Michael Jordan had to be beat great teams with great players to win championships. Carl that's Malone and John Stockton on the Jazz. That loaded Seattle team. What about Hold on. That, uh, uh, that, that loaded Magic team. I get it, but let's not twist it now. At yes, I don't think that LeBron has faced a team in the playoffs in his conference anywhere near as talented as the Orlando Magic were in 1996. That team was so stacked. That's why I always state people conveniently don't mention them. Now, at the time, the perception was Jordan missed the prime Bird McHale dynasty and the prime Magic Worthy Kareem dynasty, and the, and, and the Jordan detractors at the time said that he, he wasn't facing the competition that Bird and Magic were. 
Stephen A. Admits it. They beat him earlier before yeah, the Detroit they went championship. to the Hold on. Hold it. They beat him earlier. Then the Detroit Pistons dethroned them. And then he had to go through the Pistons. That exactly. But you know what, Stephen A. Smith? That's not part of the narrative. The anti-Jordan liberal media narrative today because the liberal media likes to promote LeBron James because he's a super liberal. The media narrative is that Jordan, he could not win until everybody got old. And when you look at the Detroit Pistons in 1991, all their top players were 30 and younger. Mark Aguirre, Isaiah Thomas were both 30. Dumars was about 28. Dennis Rodman was about 28. If you want to make a case for anything, you could say that they had a lot of mileage and wear and tear on them, but it was just time for them to go. The Bulls were primed to defeat them. They finally learned how to really play on a championship level, and that was that. That's not missing them. They, the, the Detroit Pistons took them out. And funnily enough, no one mentions that LeBron James was able to move past the Detroit Pistons after Ben Wallace left their team. No one mentions that when he finally defeated the Boston Celtics in 2011, Kevin Garnett was about 36 years old. <laughs> Ray Allen was about 35, 36 years old, as was Paul Pierce, around 34, 35 years old. They were all old, far older than the Pistons were in 1991 when Jordan beat them. But nobody mentions that. Stephen A., most but of the people Jordan having no this back. debate... He didn't have to play the Celtics back. to get to stop, the championship stop, when they were stop. great. Go ahead, Molly. the Lakers. Let me hear Molly. Yeah, but that's not really a point because as Stephen A. Smith already stated, the Celtics were not the team that the Bulls had to overcome. They had to overcome the Pistons. The Pistons had already overcome the Celtics. The Celtics were pretty much done. I was just going to say that most of the people having this debate are going to think you're wrong just simply because they never saw Jordan play. They're ignorant. You know, so they're all going to be team the LeBron just Matt based Bailey on had any never facial watching hair at that play. particular moment in time. Your opinion don't count on this, you young whippersnapper. All right, guys, Hold let's up. leave it there. You guys... Well, that's pretty much it on that. Uh, but I agree with Molly Karam's closing statement. A lot of people just speak because they never saw Jordan play and they don't understand that era. And they don't understand what basketball was about back then. It was more about half-court execution than it is now, where now it's more basically just a three-point shooting contest because there are more players on each team that are proficient at the three-point shot. But anyway, we'll see what happens with LeBron in the finals. Peace.